Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Welcome back to the Margiela series where we're exploring every single runway show that Martin Margiela produced at his eponymous house. It's time for fall 2004. We get bro time later. Bro time. Bro time. Woo. So, the setup for this location is actually pretty funny, but it's a joke that you would never get if you haven't watched this entire series. Throughout the Maison's history, they've shown in a lot of very unusual locations. Margiela kind of popularized the Gorilla Runway show, right? He's shown in post offices, cafes, public playgrounds, and they've always been in kind of far-flung areas that are way outside of where fashion critics would normally go to watch Paris Fashion Week shows. Okay, so by this time in 2004, Gorilla Runway shows are much more popular. It's much more feasible that you can just do your own show wherever you want to do it in Paris, like it is now. So now that that is starting to get more popular and that there is no need to accommodate to the whims and desires of fashion critics, Margiela decided to show the same show in 19 different locations across Paris, and all of those locations were selected because of their proximity to the hotels that critics were staying at. It's like for years, like these critics were like writing bad reviews about him and like not taking Margiela seriously because it was like, ugh, I have to get on this train and go to this abandoned subway station across Paris. They had a bad attitude about that and they were definitely willing to let Martin and the team know about it, but Martin and the team didn't care. So now, almost as if to make fun of them, they are showing in 19 different locations. At 8 p.m., a film showing the collection was screened at each of the 19 locations. The six models in the film were filmed in casual locations and with very minimal makeup and natural hair. These women answered questions about their pasts and their likes and their dislikes in English, Italian, and French. This film was a still image film, which just means that it uses uh, individual photographs to tell the narrative. This is not a terribly popular way of making films now. It was one that was really popular back when filmmaking was a fairly new art medium, and it is still very popular in uh, film school. For obvious reasons, it's very easy to make films like this. You just kind of do one voiceover, you take a series of photographs, you put them together however you want, and then the, the film kind of makes itself. Aesthetically, though, this kind of bohemian-style filmmaking is perfect for what Martin and the team always do, but it's actually even more than that. This collection was filmed in a way to emphasize their use of trompe l'oeil in this collection. We know Martin's tradition with this technique from spring-summer 1996, which is my personal favorite Margiela collection. I know that if you you watch every video on this channel, you've heard me explain this a few times, but I need to explain it again. We'll make it quick. Spring, summer 1996, they purchased a bunch of vintage garments. They took pictures of those vintage garments. Okay, put that away. They purchased vintage dresses and they pulled the linings out of those vintage dresses. So now they just have these plain silk linings. Nothing unusual about them, just silk linings of antique dresses. The photographs from these vintage clothes were then screen printed onto each of the silk slip dresses that were the linings of other vintage dresses. Vintage garment, photograph, then screen printed onto the lining of a dress. And that resulted in a lot of really cool ideas. Like they did the fur coat, they did this, uh, what Margiela referred to as a Hollywood dress. They also did this uh, large peacoat. There's a lot of really cool ideas with it. Okay, we're done. So this time, Margiela seemed to take upholstery and screen print that onto garments. This inspired the director of the film named Nigel Bennett to emphasize this trompe l'oeil in the film itself. Nigel Bennett is most dominantly known for his acting on stage and on screen, uh, but this was during a period of time when he was trying to write screenplays and do a little bit of director work, and he jumped in with Margiela. And it's actually it's super interesting. This is not listed on on IMDb as one of his films. I might have to swoop in with the edit there. Moving on. On another model, Bennett had her sit on a daybed made of wicker cane to emphasize the wicker cane print on her dress. But okay, here's the thing that actually makes this really cool. We're, we're building on a couple of different seasons ideas here. So we have the trompe l'oeil stuff from spring, summer 1996, and we also have a history of the Maison taking objects and turning them into clothes. The best example of that is the duvet coat. This is one of the most legendary things the Maison has ever produced. It is uh, almost an immortal piece of design at this point. We also have things like the plate vest and the glove bag and the cork necklace like all of these are things where the Maison just said that is such an interesting object we should just make that part of our wardrobe so here what they've done is they've taken the object idea and they've taken the trompe l'oeil idea that they've used and now objects are getting trompe l'oeil onto garments this also plays pretty deeply into the memory of objects that the Maison has been building on since the very first collection. Because here, I mean, we can see that this is more than just like, you know, leather dress made of couch leather. 
This is a print of the surface of the couch from your grandmother's house. It's the memory of these objects which are here absent in the collection. We remember back to the very first collection, spring, summer 1989, where we had the memory of a v-neck t-shirt in the fake suntan lines that the models had on their chests. We also see the memory of clothes as recently as fall 2001 in the lapel of these blazers. It was there, but it's not there now. So all of these previous ideas from the Maison are being very purposefully used. They're not just taking stuff that feels like it's on brand and throwing it out there. They are taking purposeful steps and building the narrative a little bit at the time. And this honestly, this kind of stuff is what makes fashion so interesting for storytelling. Because in a, a book or in a movie, it's really easy to tell just a cohesive narrative from beginning to end. Because you have characters, you have plot development, you have a chronology of things. But with this, there, there are much more nuanced ways of telling stories and using your own concepts and doing little flips on what you already established. This is a really, really great use of that for the Maison. This is, this is worth remembering. You know what? We will retrospectively give it an all rise. All rise. Woo! This was so sick! Fantastic conceptual framework, flawless execution, a million angels kissing in the sky. This is so, <laughs> this is great. I like it so much. Okay, stay standing, stay standing. So I'm, I'm gonna do the Patreon plug, but I'm gonna show you weird stuff that my dad has in this room that's always off camera so you can't see it. Hey team, here's the deal. This channel cannot exist without financial support. If you really love this series, if you wanna watch the full episodes of this series and get a bunch of other exclusive stuff from the channel, join the Patreon patreon.com slash plus foster. Please do that. I will love you forever. You also get to join the private discord. It's super excellent. You guys have heard this before. Please do it. Please, 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 please. I, I love you all so much. <laughs> These are uh, Matryoshka dolls. My dad loves Russian aesthetics, loves Russian culture, loves Russian people a whole lot, but he also hates the Russian government, which makes my dad in a lot of ways like the Russian people. So these are all Russian leaders. You'll note that Stalin has blood on his hands <laughs> and at the center of all of the Russian leaders is death. Some pretty biting political commentary there. All right, you may be seated. What's most important about this film is that Martin is still trying to find ways to get people to focus on the clothes themselves, even in the medium of this movie. This still image film technique aids in creating that practically. This has been done so that the Maison can bring your emphasis away from the runway experience and more onto the clothes themselves. At this point, they've been filming the shows consistently every single season, so it's not that they can't film a standard video, but rather that filming the clothes, they choose to allow ample time and space to really take in the individual images. Like this model, for example, she's walking down these stairs in a series of photographs, and it allows the viewer to really focus on the texture of the sheepskin and how it's paired with this golden lurex crumpled top and the, the knee-high tabby boots from this season. Nothing here goes unappreciated, which is what the Maison strives for in their presentations. Another cool little note about the multi-location situation is that this is the 10-year anniversary since the Maison did a multi location situation uh, all over the world. Fall winter 1994 was when all of the models dressed up and went out to different locations that were held in the same time in different time zones in eight different locations and just hosted a party. Was it eight different locations? Oh, it was nine. I failed you, I'm sorry. Nine presentations. Either way, this was the 10-year anniversary of them doing the multi-location show thing there. And the only other example that we have of that is the black and white show, which was Spring, summer, 1993. The seasoned journalists at the time were able to observe that these were knockoffs of Chanel tweed jackets. What the Maison did was they made copies of the Chanel tweed and then cut them up, reassembled them into asymmetric jackets. We're actually gonna take a moment here to learn about Chanel tweeds. Gabrielle Chanel sort of changed the landscape of women's wear when she gave women suiting options that actually felt comfortable. And this is kind of a long-standing hallmark of Chanel, which is incorporating these kind of tomboyish elements. And that might feel a little bit out of place with the Chanel that you know now in 2022. Now they kind of pitch themselves as like the height of feminine beauty, but this incorporation of tomboy elements has been a really long-standing motif there. At the time, tweed was only used for men's clothing, and Gabrielle Chanel was the first one to introduce that as a possibility in the lineup of women's options for their clothing. In trying to manipulate this iconic garment, Margiela placed the fabric in the context of its other use. 
couches, turning an object used to highlight possible gender disparity into what Martin sees it as, just an object devoid of its context. The Margiela Bible specifies that the tweed jackets were then object dyed in black dye. I sort of see this as the Maison's use of deconstruction to further highlight femininity, borrowing a jacket that once was a symbol of women having tomboyish traits, but that same symbol now is a ferociously enduring symbol of modern femininity. And considering this show in 2004 was almost 80 years after the first one was introduced by Gabrielle Chanel, it, that means that Martin has seen the gradual gender evolution of this jacket over the course of his own lifetime. As per usual, we're playing with cultural and gendered codes and kind of seeing what we can do with them if we flip them around into different positions. This also was a pretty unusual season because they did a couple of special projects, one of which being these really strange looking white masks that included a mask of George W. Bush. This was a pretty chaotic time in American politics. A lot of brands and artists that usually wouldn't get directly into political statements got very political about George W. Bush. Up to this point, the Maison has not been political about anything. I mean, a lot of people thought that the AIDS t-shirts were political, but uh, they're not. This is overtly a political topic right here. But yeah, there were a few other brands that got like overtly political at this time. Supreme got political for the first time in their entire history. It was it was a very strange time in American politics. But anyway, that's worth noting because it did indeed happen.